Do you really think this is going to help? How would you tell people that this is You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Last time, we were just being told about how paleocurrents show that Noah's flood is real, even though they don't, and it isn't. Today, we're going to get some crazy talk about plants, fossils, and rocks. So without further ado, here's Kurt. Then we have evidence that the fossils make a gradual transition from low in the sequence to high in the sequence, from sea to land. But the weird thing is that the rocks don't. There are terrestrial rocks from the Precambrian and the Cambrian. Why is that if the Cambrian is actually just the flood burying the bottom of the ocean? Also, why are there marine sediments from the end of the Cretaceous, if that's just the flood getting the upland areas? Also, how does any of this square with the mammals being at the highest elevations, when basically the whole fossil record of modern type animals is after the flood? Why didn't the flood kill and preserve a single elephant, a single dog, a single bear, a single pig, a single monkey? What's up with that? Uh, this, um, the only way this can really be shown is if you create a, a, a tree of relationship of organisms. This is something I did a number of years ago to test whether the evolutionary claim was true that the evolutionary tree of organisms is uh, shown or proven by the fossil record. Well, it's not proven. Science doesn't do proof. But evolution is indeed seen in the fossil record. And the fossil record is also predicted by evolution. Basically, all paleontology digs that receive funding do so on the basis of using geology and evolutionary biology together to know where to look for what you want to find. Perhaps most famously, Tiktaalik was found in the Canadian Arctic specifically because of a prediction of evolution about the time frame and environment in which the first fish started to walk on limbs, like a tetrapod. But also, even the various early hominins that are being found and have been found in Africa were predicted to be there all the way back by Charles Darwin who noticed that among all animals, humans were most similar to the African apes, like the gorilla and the chimpanzee. Creationism cannot make any such prediction. At best, it can accommodate the data after the fact. But that right there shows the absolute uselessness of creationism. Even if evolution weren't true and creationism were, evolution still manages to make useful predictions, and so the only reasonable thing to do in science is to keep using it and keep ignoring creationism. I had heard a number of my professors through time say the fossils show the order of evolution. What they meant was that in the evolutionary tree, the appearance, the order of branching that evolution says occurred is reflected in the order that those groups of organisms first appeared in the fossil record. That is broadly true for organisms with a good fossil record. Others we basically have no fossils of, like rotifers. So I set about to test that. In order to test it, you've got to first of all create the evolutionary tree. So I used the best uh, information that was available at the time to create an evolutionary tree of all organisms. In this case, I'm going to be looking just at the orders and above. Uh, and this is part of that evolutionary tree, but this part down here called eukaryotic kingdoms, there's more to the tree that I can't fit on here. Yeah, and it's the part of the tree that's the easiest to make fossils of, since fossilization in most cases is easier for larger organisms. Nice that we're focusing our study in exactly the place where the data will be least reliable. So we look at that tree, and there's two more branches on that tree that I can't fit on here. So you need to stick the plants in there, and you need to stick the animals in there. So you got a very big tree. Okay, apologies to Dr. Wise. Apparently he is going to bother with animals and plants. Now once you've done that, you can then uh, look at this tree and determine predict from it what the order of branching should be. It should be that the tree started down here and made its way out to the final result. So I would expect that the first branches would be the Placozoa and the Periphera in this particular tree. Then we should get the um, Archaeocyathids. Then we should get the Cnidarians. Then you should get the Tenophores and so on. And how did Dr. Wise account for taphonomic bias, which means that some organisms are far more likely to fossilize than others? For example, tenophores, or cone jellies, are quite rare in the fossil record because they're made up of very thin layers of soft tissue, so we really don't expect to see much of a fossil record of them. The same goes for many of the later forming branches too, such as Rotifera, Nematoda, and Tardigrata, which also had the disadvantage of being quite small and so doubly unlikely to fossilize in most circumstances. 
I feel like we're not even going to find out. This tree allows us to predict an order of branching. When you do that and lay them all out, you find that actually the order of branching predicted by evolution from this tree doesn't really correspond with the order of branching that you find uh, in, uh, in the fossil record, or I should say with the order of first appearance in the fossil record. In other words, when evolution says this group should have come first, that's not usually the, the first group in the fossil record. See, here's the thing. Kurt didn't show his work. But let's be fair, this is just a lecture for lay folk. It's not for scientists or people like me who are willing to do the statistical analysis ourselves. So I went looking for Wise's numbers, and near as I can tell, they're not published anywhere. Google Scholar returns plenty of his work, as does the Answers Research Journal's internal search function. But near as I can tell, none of them are this analysis. And just based on what I know of the fossil record, this result seems absurd on its face. So until Kurt bothers to show his data that he used to generate this result, there is no reason anyone should take it seriously. It's just an empty claim that he accompanied by meaningless numbers, because even this data table is meaningless without labels and an explanation. Until he shows his work, this is just him saying, look, evolution is wrong because I put numbers in a grid. And so 95% of the time, you can't reject a random order of first appearance in the fossil record. It's not consistent with evolutionary theory. Maybe, but sure would be cool if he showed his work and explained how it is that people routinely use evolutionary biology to find new fossils. So really, there's nothing to explain in the fossil record. It looks like randomness, uh, except, for, except for the fact that the 5% that does seem to correspond happens to be in groups where evolution says this group evolved from sea to land. So for example, it says that the plants evolved from the sea to land, and the plant groups seem to come into the, into the fossil record in the same order that evolution says it they should. Ah, which is also conveniently the bits that Kurt Wise thinks he can explain. Weird that his alleged data just happened to be so convenient for him, despite the fact that he won't show them publicly. Uh, the land animals are thought to have evolved from the sea, and they come in in the order that evolution predicts they should come in. So it appears that there's evidence, for the most part, of randomness, but the only pattern that really has to be explained is a sea-to-land transition, which is what I'd expect with a flood. Are we supposed to be impressed that when he won't show his work, it supports him, even though he came to his conclusion before doing the work? Seriously, this is like if you wanted to build a bridge and an architect came to you with a design for a fantastical bridge that looks really awesome, but in no way looks like it would hold up under its own weight, never mind the weight of traffic. So you ask to see his math, and he just shows you a table of numbers with statistical labels that don't really say anything because they're otherwise unlabeled. So you ask if you can see all of his calculations, and he just says, no, you can't. But really, these numbers are fantastic and totally support my conclusion that this bridge is sound. Is that the architect you're going to hire? I doubt it. A flood, in fact, buries things in the ocean first, and then eventually transgresses onto the land, taking things off of the land. I've already explained ad nauseum why that explanation doesn't actually work. Just watch earlier in this series for more of that. This can be tested. As a matter of fact, I became interested in one of those groups that seems to correspond between, uh, between evolution and the order in the fossil record, and that's the classes of plants. And here's the list of those, most of them you're probably not at all familiar with, because most of them are in fact uh, uh, extinct. The last one down there, Magnolia phyta, uh, refers to the flowering plants, which, is mo which are most of the plants of the world, the 250,000 flowering plants of the world. Uh, you got cycads and, and the um, uh, conifers in there, but most of these others are in fact extinct groups. I really feel like we need a point here. This is the order of branching predicted by evolution. Uh, and you can put numbers on these things. Uh, this is the actual order of first appearance, or actually when these groups come in in the fossil record. Again, looking at rocks from the bottom to the top, the bottom rocks being the oldest, the um, upper rocks being the youngest. That chart is a bunch of visual noise. Just display them as separate columns on varying width to show a diversity at the given period. Why stack them horizontally like that? It's just ugly, and then they're all colored green, and it's not obvious which section of the curve corresponds to which label. 
just from a data presentation standpoint, this is trash. Uh, we start out with very, and the width of this, uh, this thing in the, on the screen would in fact be how many species, how many groups, uh, how many individual, not individuals, yeah, how many species there are of a particular group. So at the very first, the fossil plants are represented by only a single species. With time, the number of plants increases. That already doesn't make sense for a flood. What ecosystem does Dr. Wise imagine could be the one with only one plant species in a world where the full diversity of plants that have ever existed exists simultaneously? The only reason that works in terms of evolution is that when you're the first species of a taxon to colonize a new habitat, you're going to be the only species in your taxon there. So when plants first colonize the land, that one species is the only one there. But they wouldn't have made it if they had had to compete with all sorts of things like switchgrass and salt warts, which were already better at water transport and tolerant of the salty areas the first plants in. They couldn't have made it. This is absolutely insane here. And then how many of those plants are in each of the groups is indicated here. And from this, we can see in the fossil record what order these groups first appeared in. You can compare the order predicted by evolution with the order predicted uh, by or shown by the fossil record, and you find a tremendous correspondence. It's 99% of the pattern can be explained by evolution, or putting it another way, the plants do seem to come into the fossil record in the same order as evolution. However, in addition to looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, you could also ask a different question. What order would you predict them to come in if you arrange them from sea to land? Well, since it would be based on how close to the ocean we find the plants, with the ones near shore being found first, I'd expect Horneophytopsida, Equidistopsida, Lacerophilopsida, Lycopsida, Psychodopsida, Ag Magniophyta, first all in a group, then the last three persisting all the way through the fossil record. Then I'd expect the rest, that is Agalophyton, Rhenopsida, Pilocopsida, Progymnospermopsida, Teriotosperms, Pinopsida, and Netopsida, to be starting somewhere in like the Permian or Triassic and then persisting. Weird how that's not at all what we find, even according to Wise. And note, I'm using his names. There are other terms for some of these groups, but I want it to be easy to compare. The thing is that most of these groups aren't well described by their favorite altitude, and members of them have both lowland and highland members, and even coastal members. Go to the swamps of Florida or the bayou, and let me know if you can find some coastal magnolia fights. The place will be covered with them. What if you considered the plants that have to have standing water to reproduce at one end of the spectrum. You mean like some magnolia fights, such as bog plants like the Venus flytrap. Okay, but they're the last to appear in the fossil record. Must have been all those mountain bogs I hear so much about. And then put them side by side as per how much water they need to survive, all the way up to animals that can survive even in, let's say, desert environments. It, <clears throat> when you put them in a an order of what might be called terrestriality, from non-terrestrial to terrestrial, you get a pattern like you have at the right. Now the pattern at the right looks very similar to the pattern at the left. Uh, extremely similar. Uh, it's not quite the same. Except you don't, because there's internal diversity in how terrestrial members of these groups are. There are straight up aquatic magnolia fights. Lotuses are aquatic, water lilies are aquatic, rice is aquatic, water chestnuts are aquatic, watercress is aquatic, Hornworts are aquatic, and skunk cabbage is semi-aquatic. All magnolia fights. Kurt, I don't believe that you've never heard of any of these plants. I bet you've eaten some of them. This is just dumb beyond belief. I am officially at the point of having trouble believing that Kurt Wise doesn't know that aquatic magnolia fights exist, and this is coming into the territory where I suspect he knows he's wrong and doesn't care. But from this, you can then predict a pattern of branching that evolution would predict, and a pattern of branching that ecology would predict if these things were arranged from sea to land. Okay, Kurt, where are my Silurian or Carboniferous water lilies, huh, Kurt? Seriously, any thought about this at all? And it just falls apart. Plus, even on his own terms, this is wrong. He has Philocopsida and Equistopsida on the same level, that is the fern and horsetails, but horsetails need wetlands and ferns grow all over forests that are by no means wetlands. In other words, ferns are considerably more terrestrial than horsetails so they should come after, but instead he has them coming into the fossil record at the same time. And you can compare those and do another uh, 
do more statistics, you basically get the same pattern. In other words, evolution can predict the pattern, but also another thing that could have produced the pattern is if the plants were actually lined up from sea to land with uh, increasing terrestriality. Still waiting on that Silurian water cabbage. I feel like I'm going to have to keep waiting. Also, why does he have seed ferns as extant? There are no known extant seed ferns. Also, I feel like gymnosperms aren't extinct because, you know, that's basically pine trees. And I think they're still around. But not according to this chart. I'm also confused by the idea that there are lycopod trees still on Earth. Maybe this chart isn't supposed to go to present, which, you know, is why you label your axes. But even if it's not, then why does it show pine trees as being extinct? Is there anything that makes sense of that? Well, I conceived of a theory a number of years ago to, to in fact explain that because of my experience once on a floating bog, on a uh, quaking bog. Quaking bogs are cool, but you know what else they are? Really fragile in anything approaching strong winds. They can just break off, and that's in inland wetlands. Never mind the coast of an ocean where the strongest storms occur. Well, take a look at this. That is a massive bog that broke away from shore and is now floating around a lake near Brainerd. The DNR says it believes the high water level, along with high winds, caused the bog to break free. The crumbs of smashed docks are now part of the traveling bog. This is the damage left behind. And don't give me, there were no pre-flood storms. Storms are an inevitable outcome of thermodynamics and the chaotic nature of fluid flow. Oh, and other young earth creationists have also debunked this idea. But we'll get to that, I'm sure. One of these vegetation mats that grows out over a lake from the shore, uh, which is a wild experience, I realized that in that situation, the plants in the floating bog were arranged from the open water to the land in increasing terrestriality. That made sense. He said with no hint of irony, given that virtually all of the plants he saw were Magnolia phyta, but we don't find any of those aquatic magnolia fights early in the fossil record. The, tr the plants that were growing out over the water, they needed water. They lived in, con lived in water continuously. The plants that were on the shore didn't need that much water. So they were arranged in a water to land, increasing terrestriality order. Does this mean that the corollary is that we shouldn't find aquatic plants late in the flood layers? If so, then that's another problem, because Montesquieu vidali is a Cretaceous aquatic angiosperm. In fact, if ecological zonation is the solution to the succession of paleofauna in the fossil record, then why do we even have ocean fish in the Cretaceous? Shouldn't the flood be hitting mountains and such? Why are there Cretaceous sea turtles and sharks? Were four meter long sea turtles swimming through mountain streams? And so I thought, well, maybe these plants in the fossil record were arranged in the same way. What if they actually represent a floating forest, like a quaking bog? Well, I think it goes without saying, no one in real science takes this idea seriously, as there's no evidence that really supports it. But let's take a look at what other creationists say. We're going to take a look at sinking the floating forest hypothesis by Tim Clary and Jeffrey Tompkins, because why bother with science when even other pseudoscientists can call out your nonsense? Well, in that write-up, Clary and Tompkins lay out a series of criteria for determining if fossil trees are preserved in situ that is, in the place where they grew without transport during the deposition of the matrix in which they're preserved. These criteria are, one, multiple single-species trees spaced in growth positions in the same horizontal plane, spaced equidistantly in all directions from the trunks as you would find in a living forest and not merely randomly spaced. Two, multiple trees in the same rock layer or along a common surface. Three, trees with root systems that cross-cut bedding layers. Four, evidence of rapid burial by thick sediment and water. Five, a lack of sedimentary rock layers underneath the trees. Six, no bowing or distortion of any sedimentary layers beneath the tree stumps. Seven, accompanying vegetation that also cross-cut the same layers as the lycopod tree stumps. I think there are a couple problems here. For example, bogs are areas of fairly rapid deposition, so I don't think that the requirement for multiple trees to be along a common surface or a horizontal plane is really necessary, nor is four well-defined. Is normal bog deposition rapid enough? I don't know. Similarly, six really isn't necessary since post-lithification bending is a thing that occurs. But either way, all of these are reasons why they're too restrictive in identifying in situ forests. And that doesn't really matter to their point, because they did in fact find a fossil forest from the Carboniferous system of rocks that meets their criteria. Which means, I would also agree, that it is an in situ forest preserved in the fossil record. The site is in Glasgow, Scotland. 
and was discovered in a rock quarry outside the city proper. Given the preserved soil horizons and in-situ networks, and as Clarion Tompkins point out, the fact that Wise is simply wrong that lycopod trees had hollow trunks and roots, in fact, they were not hollow at all, all of this adds up to say, when even other creationists aren't buying it, it's time to go back to the drawing board. So I reconstructed a forest by basically taking the order in the fossil record and then, and then bringing it straight up to draw a picture of this floating forest. I propose that there was a floating forest on the pre-flood world's oceans that's the size of a continent, very large. I mean, the size of North America, for example, it's huge. And I say that it's large like that because the main trees of this, in fact, produce the coals of the eastern United States, Europe, and Asia. That's a lot of coal. No one has coal forests on the ocean like antediluvian Earth. They're huge. Best coal forests you've ever seen. In fact, many people, they tell me, gee, we've never seen coal forests this awesome. And believe me, I know it. I mean, these things are tremendous. That's a lot of forest. So we have to propose a very large forest to explain it. This, um, in this particular theory, this floating forest would have existed in the world before the flood, would have floated on the oceans before the flood, would have been quite fine until it came to the flood. When the flood came along, waves would tend to break up this forest, and they'd break it up from the outside of the forest towards the middle. Do you think Kurt knows that waves happen without global floods? I mean, the ocean is full of waves and wind, and that's what breaks up quaking bogs. Does he have a model for how the ocean managed to not have strong winds or waves before the flood? Did the atmosphere just not have convection cells? Because that's what drives winds and waves, usually. And that would be more than sufficient to break up such a floating forest. And so the first things that would be, would be torn off and buried would be the organisms at the edge of the forest and then it would work its way in towards the center of the forest. This would actually explain the order of appearance of the major groups of plants. Except for the fact that all later groups of plants have aquatic members specifically in the kind of boggy environment he's talking about, including salty areas like sedgegrass. Sedgegrass would have loved that place, yet it is not apparent in the fossil record in times like the Devonian, Silurian, or Carboniferous. Uh, which is what I was interested in, in the first place. It also means that if you looked at the organisms, the plants that were buried at the bottom, it's like you were looking at the edge of this floating forest. So if you go into a, um, a museum and you see a diorama for the early Devonian, that'd be in pretty old rocks with, with uh, uh, plants in them, this is going to illustrate several plants like uh, Zostrophyllites and uh, uh, rhineophytes and so on, but this is basically a picture not of a particular time in earth history before the rest of the plants. Rather, it's the edge of the floating forest looking out to sea, ignore the mountains in the background, and you've got a picture of the edge of the floating forest. So we know that in modern wetlands, things like lizards, flies, water striders, caddisflies, etc. thrive. Where were they in the Devonian? Why not a single lizard, fly, water strider, or caddisfly? Do they only live in upland swamps? What kept them out of the floating bogs? And don't say salt tolerance, because if things like silverfish, tetrapods, and scorpions can adapt to salt there, what makes water striders special that they can't? Especially since, you know, Halobates is a thing, a genus of water striders with some 40 species that are seagoing. That is, they live on the surface of the actual ocean. After this, he repeated himself about how different time periods in his mind map onto different distances from the edge of his imaginary forests, we're skipping that. So a floating forest theory explains the increasing terrestriality of plants in the fossil record, but it explains another thing too. I realized that in the floating bogs that I had been on, the plants that grow out over the water were very small plants. Whereas as you get further and further away from the water towards the shore, the plants get progressively taller. So there's actually an increase in size corresponding to the increase in terrestriality in modern quaking bogs. Sure, but since this is a prediction of both evolution and quaking bogs, I'm not sure why it matters. But there's also an increase in size corresponding to, this, to the increase in terrestriality in the fossil record. 
So the floating forest theory explains both of those. Plus, I guess, yeah, sure, but it needs to explain all the data. And it really doesn't. Even other creationists know it. It explains the fact that most of these fossil plants are extinct or near extinct. Only if you make the assumption that such plants can only grow on floating vegetative mass, which there's no reason to assume, especially since modern analogs of quaking bogs are not made up of distinct assemblages of flora, but rather the same species that are growing on land. And it makes sense because if in fact there was a floating forest before the flood, and the flood destroyed that floating forest, it's unlikely that the floating forest would ever be able to regrow on the rough oceans following the flood. How did it grow on rough oceans before the flood? Just magic? It's magic, isn't it? God could have created the floating forest in place, and it would be quite happy until the flood. But once you have destroyed it, and you now have winds and choppy seas following the flood, I don't see any way in which that floating forest could regrow. Yep. It was magic. I am shocked. Shocked. Well, not that shocked. That would, ex that would mean that the plants of the floating forest would, ha would, would, ha would be hard-pressed to find an ecosystem where they could live. Because their ecosystem, the one they were designed for, has been destroyed. Oh, so organisms tend to go extinct after their ecosystem is destroyed. That didn't happen to basically everything during the flood? There should be essentially nothing alive after that, because guess what? You can't reestablish bogs, fens, forests, jungles, savannas, etc. after a global flood salts the earth and kills virtually all plants and even more of the animals. The other observation that is consistent with this the these theory, and something I was always bothered by when I saw the fossil plants myself through the years, is that many of these plants are actually preserved in marine sediments. Since not even other creationists agree with that, I'm going to need a citation on that one. Also, if the whole Paleozoic and Mesozoic are just a result of a single flood, what does that even mean for sediments to be marine versus terrestrial? It's all just the ocean rising. Shouldn't everything be marine? And if so, then you can't point out that Devonian or Silurian plants are in marine sediments as if the Cretaceous ones aren't. Even if really they're not, because according to the flood model, they should all be in marine turbidites. Of course, the fact that they're not is direct disconfirmation of the flood in the first place, so the whole talk is moot, but oh well. They're not found in terrestrial sediments, the sediments on the land, they were, they were found in marine sediments, sometimes intermixed with uh, other fossils that would indicate a, a marine situation. Like what? Is there a shark or a sea star in a carboniferous coal forest? I'd sure like to see that. Perhaps we could be given an example of an obviously marine organism in, say, the fossil grove of Scotland or the petrified forests of Arizona and New Mexico. So I used to ask my professors, well, how is it that this particular fossil ends up in a marine environment? He says, well, it floats down the river and ends up you know, being deposited out there in the ocean, uh, being carried there by the, by the rivers. Oh, so not actual evident forests, just bits of plants and marine sediments. And here I thought we were talking about coal beds and the like. The, the problem there is that, that the, in the marine realm, those, micro, those organisms at the bottom of the ocean do a very good job of destroying whatever comes down the, uh, the streams. Uh, we just don't find fossils like that in those kinds of environments. Evidently, we do, because Kurt just said that we do. So I don't know what to tell you, except he's just contradicting himself. This theory, however, says that the reason we find these plants in marine rocks is because it was a marine ecosystem. It floated above the marine realm, and when it was destroyed, it was destroyed and buried in the marine realm. So it explains why, in fact, they're found in marine rocks. Well, that's great, except, you know, there's no evidence for it, and it makes predictions that have already failed, like what plants and animals should actually be there. And I'll keep pointing out that there is no reason members of extant taxa, such as lizards and sedge, shouldn't be there, and Wise hasn't even begun to explain why they're not. Another thing that it explains, though, is the fact that uh, some of these plants are actually very strange. If you look at a cross-section of the trees found in the center of this floating forest, in other words, the trees of the, uh, of the coal forest, you find that they're basically hollow. Now, technically, they're not hollow as in air in them, they have arenchymous tissue in the, in the center of it, which means they have a very light, um, thin tissue that 
has as its purpose carrying air, but there are cells and cell tissues in there to facilitate that. Most of the structure, most of the weight of the tree is held up by bark, successive layers of bark and not what we're used to in the center of trees, which is called secondary wood. There's no secondary wood in these things. They're basically hollow or airy tissues in the center of the, uh, of, of the stems. Here, let's just quote Cleary and Tompkins on this one. Another line of reasoning put forth in support of the floating forest hypothesis is that the arborescent lycopods were hollow in both their main aerial trunks and in their roots, a contention based primarily on speculation and not soundly supported by the scientific literature. The majority of the hollow tree studies do not take into account a number of key reports describing the non-hollow internal structure of lycopods. Research has demonstrated that intact, non-decayed aerial stems of arborescent lycopods clearly indicate a contiguous tissue structure across the breadth of the stem, with the same general schema found in trunks and roots. And even the roots, or what look like roots, they're technically not roots because of this feature, uh, the roots are also hollow, which is an odd thought. How in the world does a plant put a hollow root into into soil. How does it force its way into soil and remain hollow? Well, ignoring the fact that they're not hollow, you do it by growing. Roots aren't tentacles that grow to full size above the soil and then have to push down into the soil in a single go. They grow there, and the tip of the hollow root isn't going to be itself hollow. So I don't see why this would be a problem, even if it were true. But of course it's not true, and as Clary and Tompkins know, these roots grew through actual bedding planes and through paleosols, which would be impossible in Wise's model. Uh, and it gets worse when you see that coming off of the roots or rhizomes are these are perpendicular to them are straw sized soft hollow structures that are coming off of the uh, off the roots the rootlets small soft rootlets that were preserved in situ even according to creationists after the forest was ripped apart by a flood okay yeah that checks out uh, they come off at 90 degrees to the main axis. They are hollow and they're clearly very soft. How in the world does that grow through soil? No idea. By not being soft or particularly hollow, because they're not. And again, they did grow through soil. A paleosol is a fossil soil, and those are evident in many of the locations where we find lycopod tree fossils. This isn't a thing we have to wonder about. It's right there. In fact, in the present world, we do have some plant, these are tree sized, but in the present world, we have plants that are hollow stemmed, hollow rooted, and have just exactly that kind of root, rootlet, where the rootlets come out from the main root at 90 degrees to, uh, to, the, to the primary root, and they're hollow. And all of those plants are themselves floating plants. Floating plants that conveniently weren't in these forests for, you know, no reason. It's like Kurt is trying to be as wrong as possible, and he's succeeding. Or does he just mean modern lycopods? I don't know. But modern lycopods don't all float, so who knows? And uh, back in 1981, Joachim Schevin in Germany proposed that these plants, just these plants, just the center plants of the what, I, what I'm calling the floating forest, in fact, floated. He proposed this. I didn't know about this when I, I proposed my theory of the floating forest. Uh, he had a number of years proposed this for just some of the trees, namely the, the large trees of the, uh, of the coal forest. Oh, so scientists already examined and discarded this idea. Good to know. And you know what? I'm done with it too. He just goes on and on about how floating forests make coal. But guess what? There's no reason to think that they were floating forests. So no matter how much he thinks he can explain coal, it doesn't matter. Because he hasn't done the work to show that they were floating forests in the first place. We'll talk about a few of the other things he mentions though, but not line by line. He's far too repetitive. So one thing he says is that there's no way to get such flat bedding without a floating forest. But coal forests are analogs to modern bogs, which are in fact quite flat. He also said that Steve Austin found most coal was made from bark. Even if true, that doesn't really help or harm the forest hypothesis. He also says that coal seams indicate that the continents were together, but the problem is that in some cases, they're from the interior of the supercontinent, such as the Appalachian coal beds. He also goes into alleged carbon dating, but in most cases, carbon dating is just done by beta decay measuring, and carbon-14 isn't the only thing that does that. But even when it's done by mass spectroscopy, the dates 
they get are just basically the oldest date you can get with carbon-14, and is essentially what you get if you do the test with the test chamber empty, because there's no way to completely evacuate the test chamber, so there will always be residual carbon-14, and that residual carbon-14 will give you a reading. Also, he says that animals like Acanthostega and Tiktaalik were especially created because other animals couldn't put their weight on the floating forest? The fact that humans can walk on quaking bogs is a direct refutation of this. He also seems to think that you can just measure the vertical size of a stratum and infer how long it took to deposit, but that's not true in the least. If that's not what he's saying, then the only other thing I can take from it is that he thinks that a stratum always was laid down continuously from when it starts to when the next layer starts up, but that's also not true. Deposition can halt and erosion start, and that's basically it. Those are the only new claims he makes. And yeah, I can't just keep doing a line by line when he's so repetitive and his last claims are some of the worst ones. But here is his closing. I believe that uh, the, uh, the, the fossils of the flood are in fact best explained by the flood. The processes responsible for the major features of the Earth's fossil record are a global sedimentation, Except there is no such global stratum. And remember, one should expect a flood to make essentially one big stratum, all of it turbidite. Deposition in water. Well, deposition by wind and falling ash through the air is well known throughout the fossil bearing strata, so we failed that one. Deposition by catastrophe. There are indeed rocks deposited catastrophically, but we have not been given reason to think that the ones that couldn't be were, and there are a lot of those. And in fact, destruction of everything on the planet, which is consistent with God's judgment of man's sin in the flood in the days of Noah. Except we have terrestrial organisms that go right through the supposed flood boundary without being destroyed. So it wasn't a destruction of everything. In fact, oddly enough, the discontinuity between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene is far less than that between the Permian and the Triassic. But anyway, that's it. That's the end of this whole thing. My goodness, it got boring even for me at the end there. I spared you from about 10 minutes of repetitive rambling about floating forests with no citations. You're welcome. Well, I hope to see you next time. If you liked this video, hit the like button. If you didn't, tell me why not in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, please do subscribe and hit the bell icon and turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Benthoven, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mavity Babity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out.